Good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and get started with today's COVID-19 press briefing. Today is Tuesday, September 29th, and we have Nita Ludwig, the Administrator of the Rock Island County Health Department, Ed Rivers, Director of the Scott County Health Department, and then joining us today to discuss issues related to the pandemic for the senior population are Jennifer Bodecker with St. Ambrose University School of Social Work, Laura Kopp, the President and CEO of KSI, the Quad Cities Center for Active Seniors, and Holly Brookman with Western Illinois Area Agency on Aging. Each of our individuals on the call will have some prepared statements to share with you. We will then go to our question and answer section and answer those questions as they are typed in. If your question is for any of the panelists in particular, please make sure to include that in your question. Um, and from there, we'll try to answer them to the best of their abilities. So we're going to go ahead and get started. First, Nita, can you start with any case counts that you have for us today? Sure, good afternoon. We are saddened today to report another two deaths in Rock Island County, a man in his, uh, in his 80s and a woman in her 80s have passed. And we offer our deepest condolences to the families and friends of those individuals. Also, in addition, we have 32 new COVID-19 cases, which brings our total now to 3,124 cases in Rock Island County. The death toll now is at 85. And there are currently 21 people hospitalized in Rock Island County. I would also like to take this time to remind everyone that Rock Island County Health Department has a drive-through flu shot clinic tomorrow at the Greater Quad City Auto Auction, which is in Milan, Illinois, and that will be 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. We encourage everyone to get their flu shots this year. Thank you. In Scott County today, the number of cases stands at 3,059, and our deaths remain at 28. Today, we will be joined by community partners who serve the senior population. We know that seniors are often one of the most vulnerable populations, and they rely on the protective actions of the rest of us in order to stay safe from the COVID-19 pandemic. Unfortunately, in the past few weeks, we continue to see an increase in cases. Our current 14-day average of cases is getting dangerously close to the value we're seeing in our surge in July. As a community, we're still, still trying to recover from this. In the month of August, Scott County saw 11 COVID-19 related deaths. This one month total was the same as the four previous months combined. Our current increase in cases are not in school age persons, but in all ages. That means that the increase is due to community spread. The most likely cause is individuals gathering in groups, not social distancing, and not using masks to help reduce the spread. As we enter the flu season, this is worrisome. As we've noted before, our healthcare system utilizes the same resources to treat individuals with COVID-19 as it does for those with influenza. If COVID-19 cases remain elevated, it could create challenges to our local health system that it may not be able to surmount. We plan to talk more about this topic on Thursday's briefing. Our ask of the community is to do the inconvenient yet vital things that will help protect our neighbors, friends, family, workforce, and healthcare system. Wear a mask, don't gather in groups, Keep distance between yourself and others. And last, be honest when you're feeling sick and make the right decision. Stay home and don't spread the virus to others. Thank you, Ed and Nita. We will now hear from our partners that are joining us for today. Today we'll start with Jennifer Bodeker with St. Ambrose University. Jennifer's going to be sharing some slides with us. So Jennifer, please feel free to go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and unmute myself now before I share the screen and then start talking and realize I don't have audio, so I'll do that first. Um, I just want to first thank you for the opportunity um, to speak today and um, thank you for the health departments to focus on the older adult population. 
um, especially like we said, they're a vulnerable population and even more so now um, with these effects of social isolation um, due to the safety guidelines to keep them safe. Um, so as I said, I'm Jen Boddicker. I'm the Director of Field Education and Clinical Instructor at St. Ambrose University School of Social Work. And prior to my position here, I was the Assistant Director at the Western Illinois Area Agency on Aging. Um, so I spent six years there and the aging population is dear to my heart as is all of um, the people on this call just wanting to protect the vulnerable population. So I'm gonna just focus on in general, you know, what are we looking at um, with the adult population? when it comes to COVID and the safety guidelines. Um, so social isolation was already a concern before COVID hit. Um, now it's even a greater concern because it really is creating this um, you know, environment for older adults to remain inactive, um, to stay at home, to not be connected to other people, to keep them safe, which is what we wanna do, but we have to find ways um, to really combat the social isolation in unique ways, in different ways, which I'm sure you'll hear from Laura and Holly. Um, but like I said, it was already a serious health risk in general before COVID. Um, so the National Academies of Sciences and Engineering and Medicine had come out with a report in February identifying the health risks uh, with social isolation and loneliness. So things like it significantly increasing a person's risk of premature death. It also being associated with 50% um, increase in a risk of dementia. So those are two areas, again, we already know is a concern, um, the, the, the risk of dementia increasing as older adults age. So keeping them active mentally, keeping them active physically. Um, and then again, with premature death, you know, that being linked to that. And what we also find is that with social isolation, it leads to loneliness, um, which also creates another situation of higher rates of depression, anxiety, and suicide. So really to start out to understand this was already a concern before COVID hit, and then now it's even greater concern. Um, there was already research and evidence showing that we had to address this in the senior population, which is where senior centers and area agencies on aging create programs and support to really um, identify this issue and help um, you know, older adults through the aging years to age and be active physically, mentally, and socially. So like I said, COVID presents another situation you know, for the older adult population. Um, in general, uh, our older adults are at a much higher risk if they were um, to get COVID, uh, as we were just hearing about the, the two deaths of the 80-year-old um, older adults. Um, so they're already at a, a much higher risk than the rest of the population. Um, so again, these safety guidelines are so important and people wearing masks and socially distance um, and keeping you know, people at home as much as possible. Um, but then the hard part is the safety guidelines that protect older adults are also making it even harder for them and making it a, a harder situation to get out of the social isolation and creating a situation of inactivity. Um, so that's the tricky part that we're in right now is that we're keeping them safe by doing this, but we're also creating another situation that we have to address. Um, because it has potential, depending on every situation, but to potential detrimental effects uh, to older adults' physical, mental um, health, and just their social and emotional um, you know, activity as well. So those are the two areas that I'll focus on is the physical health effects and the mental health effects. Um, so physical health effects, we always are saying how important it is for older adults to remain active. Um, to be, you know, getting out of the house as, you know, to be active, going to the grocery store is being active, um, going for a walk is being active, um, getting up in between commercials if they're watching a show. We're trying to tell older adults be active as much as you can because it helps your health, it helps your mental health. Um, so again, now we look at the COVID guidelines that are telling older adults to stay at home, which is taking it, them to an inactive state. So they're no longer able to, or it's not safe for them to go to the grocery store, to go to religious services, to go to a senior center, which is what we're telling them to do, to be active and get out there and be moving and be socially and mentally active. So that's a concern is them automatically putting it, being put into a situation where they're just going to be physically inactive just because they're staying at home. Um, you think of them just going to the grocery store and let's say religious services, um, you know, once a day, that's being physically active and helping them. And so you think of an older adult that now no longer goes to a grocery store and has their groceries delivered, they're getting a social connection of that person delivering it, but they're not getting the physical activity of actually physically going to the grocery store. Um, 
the other concern is, is the risk of falling. So we want older adults to be physically active to decrease the risk of falling. So when they're more inactive, it's going to increase that risk of falling, which we see other statistics come in of premature death as well. Um, so I would say that's the first concern is the physical health effects. The next is mental health effects. So again, we're saying it's critical for them to be physically active. Well, we're telling them it's critically important for them to be socially active, which Laura and Holly will talk about um, programming um, that is done to keep older adults socially active and connected with others. So whether it's a congregate meal site that they're going and socially connected with others at a meal, whether it's having, um, you know, a card club or um, a dance, like maybe they have line dancing or thing like that. It's, it's connection with other people and interests. But again, with our COVID safety guidelines, it's kept, you know, it's there to keep them safe, but it's also forcing them to be completely isolated from their family, from their loved ones, um, from their neighbors, from their friends, even from their significant others. Um, so we might have an older adult that has their loved one, um, their significant other in a nursing home. They're not able to visit them at all. They're not able to physically go there because of the COVID situation. Um, so again, we're decreasing contact with others in all these areas. They're remaining in the home, so they have limited public outings. So it's creating this huge influx of isolation as well as loneliness, that they feel lonely because they're not connected and in connection with other people. Um, you know, it's hard because, you know, we're using Zoom today. We can use things like Zoom to stay connected. Not all adults have, older adults have that ability or that um, uh, capability. Um, so we look at the barriers to, to barriers to technology. So whether they can afford it, whether if they have the equipment, so a computer or a phone or an iPad, whether they have the income to support um, having those types of things and having that connection. Um, so we think of they're already socially isolated and they're vulnerable, and they also may not even have the ability to connect with people, which in, uh, in other generations and in other uh, groups in, um, in our public are able to just get on Zoom or get on FaceTime, and our older adults might not be able to do that. Um, so what we're seeing mental health wise is we're going to see an increase of depression, of stress, of anxiety. They're worried about getting COVID. They're worried about their family members getting COVID. They're worried about if they are in a group with somebody. So let's say a family member comes over to visit them. Just all that stress and anxiety that's happening, even though they really need a connection, they're fearful of that connection. So what can we as a community do? I think first and foremost is just check in on our older adults. Um, whether it's a neighbor or a friend or someone that you might go to, um, you know, church with, just connecting with these older adults. And the connection piece is tricky because some, you know, some of our age groups connection is just getting on Instagram or Facebook and we feel connected, but our older adults connection to them and what they need and want and desire is talking and being in the presence of another person where they can talk and interact. And that's connection, which is really important to them as opposed to connected and knowing what's going on in their family or in their friends. Um, so I think as much as we can, whether phone or email, um, you know, or just Zoom or FaceTime if, if able to, but connecting with these older adults and checking on them frequently. The next, as we were talking about, um, is wear a mask and maintain social distance, you know, to protect our, our community, but to protect this vulnerable population of older adults. Wear a mask, maintain social distance. If you are in the presence of an older adult, make sure you have that mask on and keep that distance to keep them safe, keep you safe, keep our community safe. And then the last two pieces, encourage older adults to stay active. They may not wanna hear it from us or hear it from a loved one, but as much as they can stay active in their home um, is going to keep them healthier and is going to keep them in a better situation as opposed to um, you know, their muscles deteriorating and them not having that physical ability that they once had. Um, so again, as much as they can stay active, whether it is just walking around the house, doing some laps in the house, or if it's safe, you know, to, if they can take a lap around um, the, maybe their neighborhood, um, and if they have to wear a mask, you know, just as much activity they can do to keep their body moving. And share information and resources. Like I said, you know, we have a lot of connections to the internet or maybe groups or things like this, a press briefing where we hear information, whereas um, an older adult may not have all those different outlets of, of hearing information and knowing what's available. Um, so letting them know if you know of any inform uh, information or resources that would help, um, again, keep them safe in their home, keep them active, keep them connected. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, point out two areas, like I said, as, as we talk about the mental health and the physical health. 
well. Um, the connection piece, whether it's a friend, a neighbor, um, a, fam or a, a friend, a neighbor or a family member, um, connecting with them. And it could be a phone call, it could be a virtual call. Um, I've even seen how um, some people are doing pen pals. Get creative, you know, just as much as we can keep that connection for as long as this goes on that we can really keep them um, and support them. And then staying active, again, keep them moving, encourage them to stretch, even stretching, walking it around their house. Like I said, inside or outside, they could be dancing to music. That could be something fun and different. Um, and just being mindful of being active. Um, exercise doesn't mean they have to run a marathon, but just being active 30 minutes a day. Um, again, because they're not going to places that they may have been going to that kept them active. So just being active as much as possible. Um, with that, you know, my last slide is just a reference to that, that report that I mentioned. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for starting us off with some great information. I know Laura and Holly will have some very similar things to share in terms of what our community is doing to respond. So thank you so much for that. Uh, next, we will be hearing from Laura Kopp with KSI. So please go ahead, Laura. Thanks, Brooke. And thanks, Jen. That was a great presentation. I think you captured pretty much everything that we, from a senior center perspective, want to share with the community, not just with our seniors, but for those that love them and for those maybe who are loving them from afar and are asking, what can I do for my loved one? They're, they're kind of trapped in their home. They're trying to follow these guidelines, but I'm starting to see some frayed edges. Um, again, I'm Laura Kopp. I'm president and CEO with KSI, uh, the Center for Active Seniors here in Eastern Iowa. We're one of the only senior centers in Eastern Iowa, and we've been around for about the last 50 years, and we have had some really difficult times lately. Our mission is to provide large group activities for older adults over the age of 65. And in the world of COVID, that is the exact opposite thing that you want to do right now. And so we've really been spending the last seven months um, trying to create some virtual programming that can do exactly what Jen was talking about, help our folks stay active, but also help them stay connected because we know that socialization is one of the number one ways to age successfully and age with grace. And so we've been doing that by, um, we have a walking club that we host uh, three times a week. We go out to Vanderveer Park, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. We meet at 8.30 in the morning, right outside the Botanical Center. This is open to anyone. You do not need to be a member of KSI or affiliated with KSI. You don't even have to be a certain age. If you are looking for an opportunity, to stay connected with other folks here in the Quad Cities and you're looking for a way to stay active, um, we encourage you to come out and spend a little time with us. Everyone brings a mask and we do practice social distancing and everyone is encouraged to exercise and walk at their own speed. So you don't need to stay with the group. You can do um, whatever you, you care to do at your own speed, but it's all about having opportunities for us to connect and stay engaged with each other. We also have been doing uh, several drive-through events where we can have folks stay in their car. Everyone stays masked up, but you still get to drive through at KSI and get to see the staff and some of the other members in a very responsible way or a very social distance way. So we started doing that for Senior Citizens Day where we had a drive-through where folks would get a small treat. And then we did another one today, which was a drive-through ice cream social, if you will. I wish we would have done this last week when it was maybe 80 and 85 degrees, not 50 degrees, but um, I was told today it's never too cold for ice cream. So um, keeping folks young at heart, again, keeping them connected, getting them out of the house. Um, and then we will also be sponsoring two large drive-through dinner events as well for the holidays as they're coming up. So for Thanksgiving, as well as Christmas, many of our seniors have become accustomed to having holiday meals here at KSI. Um, those are sponsored by the JCs and the Davenport Fire Department, respectfully and respectively. And um, we usually have between three and 400 people that come out for those dinners. So they are 
critical, not just nutritional opportunities, but um, congregating opportunities and socialization and um, building relationships types of things. So we didn't want to lose that. We certainly wanted to keep our partners engaged and we certainly wanted to continue providing opportunities for folks to get together. So we have figured out a way to still provide those meals as a drive-through flyby option, if you will. So there'll be um, information on that on our website at caseiseniors.org. Folks can also follow us on Facebook. We have our own Facebook page where we have been posting our instructors doing exercise classes that folks can tune into. They can replay them as often as possible because they are stored there on our Facebook page. And they can engage with us and keep up to breast on what's going on at the center as well. And that is the Center for Active Seniors, Inc. on Facebook. That's where a lot of our information is being held. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit also just to expand on Jen's presentation and talk a little bit about our senior advocacy program. Our, a good majority, about 75% of our programming at the center has been indefinitely suspended as a result of COVID. As I mentioned, um, with our mission being providing large group activities for folks over the age of 65, it's very irresponsible, or at least it feels very irresponsible for us to provide any of those activities in person when we can't ensure that we're going to be able to maintain um, six feet of distance, that we're not able to really feel confident um, that community spread is under control in our community. And until we can do that, we don't feel that we'll be able to provide the activities. We usually provide close to 8,000 activities every year that are geared towards socialization, health and wellness, and support of our membership. Um, we're not providing any of those activities right now. And we have also suspended, unfortunately, our adult day program, which is a an adult day program for individuals that are suffering with Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia when they can no longer stay safely at home by themselves and their caregivers need respite. Um, this program has been around for close to 30 years and is one of Eastern Iowa's only adult day programs with such specific um, services to the dementia population. And so um, what I wanted to talk about was our senior advocacy program. Our senior advocacy program has remained 100% at full capacity throughout the pandemic. We, we shuttered our activities March 17th and our advocacy program has been able to be very nimble and very responsive in providing a senior emergency specific response to COVID as well as to the recent derecho. Um, what we started seeing in the early stages of the pandemic, as Jen mentioned, was we were really encouraging our senior population to self-isolate. And so we had folks that were really terrified of leaving their apartment, their apartment themselves, just to go down and check their mail down at the, in the lobby, let alone to um, go to the grocery store or to pick up their prescriptions. And so our senior advocates who are social workers, who are, um, their regular jobs is going out into the community to visit with older adults, assess their living situation, and to connect them with the services and supports they need to age successfully. That team was uniquely prepared to provide an emergency response to folks that were homebound now and were forced to remain at home um, and potentially suffering the effects of isolation and loneliness. And so we were able to connect with those folks, make sure that they had the resources that they need. A lot of times that was just a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone who was laying eyes on them. It could um, ensure that they were safe and just listen to their cares and concerns. And again, like Jen mentioned, pass along that information that they needed so critically at the beginning. We also, with the help of several funders in our community, were able to start a small home delivered meal program for those individuals that were really struggling to access nutritional food sources and sustainable food sources. Um, that program served close to 700 um, meals so far um, since beginning in April. And then I think, as Jen mentioned, our senior advocates have really been working to help older adults navigate a more um, virtual reality or a re real virtual um, landscape these days. And so many of our older adults, 
adults don't have mobile devices, so maybe they're still working from a desktop. Many of them do not have um, the experience and the knowledge to navigate things like virtual health appointments, um, even just staying connected with their loved ones through social media or FaceTime or even things like this, like Zoom. And so a lot of what our advocates have been doing is helping them to access those types of care to make sure that they are staying connected with their healthcare professionals, that if they are demonstrating signs of frayed mental health, which we're starting to see a lot of, that they are able to connect them with mental health providers in the community. Um, during the recent Duray show, our folks were really instrumental in helping seniors stay safe when they, and many of our seniors were in multi-level senior living complexes and they were without electricity, which meant that they were without elevators. And many of them had mobility issues. They um, were not able to access stairs and, and navigate um, stairs. And so they were, they were without refrigeration, they were out electricity, without air conditioning. And so a lot of what our advocates were out there doing was helping folks to access healthy food and dispose of spoiled food after a few days when they were going so long without the electricity. So um, I guess what I, what I really want as a takeaway is that while our activities remain limited here at the center, we are providing opportunities for engagement and socialization. And we do have supportive services for older adults that maybe don't know where to turn to look for services and supports to help navigate the situation that really does not have a foreseeable end date. So um, if you or anyone that you know and love is a senior that is looking for assistance or is starting to show signs of um, isolation and loneliness or frayed edges from a mental health perspective, we have folks here that can help and they can be reached um, here at KSI. Um, the number here is 563-386-7477. Um, just leave a message and one of our senior advocates will be in touch as soon as possible. Thanks, Brooke. Thank you. So Thanks, Laura. We appreciate you being on and sharing all that great stuff. Next, we're going to hear from Holly with Western Illinois Area Agency on Aging. And Holly, we have about four to five minutes of our scheduled time left. We had some great information, so I don't mean to rush you, but we want to make sure and get all your good stuff out before we have to conclude the briefing for today. So please go ahead. All right, thank you, Janet, and thank you for having me today. I will try to be um, as brief as possible. I do have a, a lot of stuff on my uh, agenda, but I think that I can probably summarize it up fairly quickly for you guys. So I am from the Western Illinois Area Agency on Aging. We serve Rock Island County and nine other counties in Western Illinois, uh, Bureau, Henderson, Henry Knox, McDonough, Mercer, LaSalle, Putnam, and Warren, to um, give you a list of all of them. Uh, and we don't actually provide a lot of direct services necessarily through our agency, um, um, but we fund community focal points in each one of those counties which do provide services to older adults and some of those services are things like um, senior center activities information and assistance uh, ship counseling benefit access uh, caregiver information and assistance um, and services to address um, older adults who are socially isolated um, during normal times we provide congregate meal sites for older adults um, to come together and share a meal every day uh, but during the COVID-19 shelter at home all of our community focal points have been um, closed for in-person activities, which means that all of those congregate meal sites have had to switch over to home delivered meals and that all of our weekly bingo activities and engagement opportunities that are done in group settings have had to be um, unfortunately canceled or restructured in a different format. Um, and as a result of the COVID-19 restrictions, our community focal points are making a really concentrated effort to connect with older adults they serve by phone at least weekly, if not bi-weekly. And um, their employees and trained volunteers are reaching out to individuals and using these weekly wellness checks to touch base with individuals, make sure their, their needs are being met, you know, um, kind of have a little bit of conversation and engagement with them, uh, make sure that they're receiving their medications and that they're able to communicate with their healthcare providers regularly and kind of get all those basic needs met. Um, the weekly wellness checks are really a, a vitally important um, part of remaining connected to our older population right now, especially for homebound individuals who really haven't been able to, to get out and do much of anything during this time. Um, 
our home delivered meal providers have really uh, stepped up a lot. I want to give them a little bit of a shout out. Uh, prior to COVID-19, they would um, their process was to kind of go up to the, the door, knock on the door, and, and hand the participant their meal. And of course, during COVID, we weren't able to have those interactions anymore. But um, as opposed to just kind of dropping it off and leaving, what they have done is kind of implemented a phone call into that. So they'll drop the meal off on the porch, go back to their vehicle, um, and then call the participant to let them know that their meal is waiting on the porch to them and use that opportunity as a daily kind of interaction to check in on them and make sure they're okay. And many seniors have kind of related to us that that's the only, like one of the only human interactions that they get on a daily basis. So when you talk about social isolation and people that may be experiencing higher than usual levels of, of a lack of interaction, that one phone call a day that they know they can count on is, is pretty critical. Um, a lot of our locations also offer friendly call lines, which is something that um, any older adult who um, is desiring more social interaction or maybe just desires to have somebody call in and check on them once a week. Um, and it's just an opportunity, again, to, you know, have some engagement for people who are maybe missing out on some interaction and socialization opportunities. Um, I guess I'm not sure how much time I have left. I want to make sure that I am um, advising people that if they are encountering older adults who may um, have concerns over social isolation to do reach out and connect with your senior centers and and get them hooked up with a call line because that is a, a very um, valuable service to a lot of older adults that they find um, helpful to them. Janet, how am I doing on time? And if you have any final things you want to do to wrap it up, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, I just would like to mention also that along with the phone lines and, and um, friendly conversations that we're um, reaching out to people with, we also are trying to implement some virtual programming as well. Um, I would like to mention the Well Connected program, which is something that any older adult um, can access. It's free of charge. And what they um, offer are virtual programs that are, um, they have a catalog, it's about 30 pages long, with just about any kind of engagement opportunity you could imagine. They have music programs, book clubs, um, coffee talk, sports talk, trivia groups, just a wide variety of things that older adults can connect with. It's completely free um, and very easy to connect if they maybe aren't as technologically um, knowledgeable as, as, as um, some people, uh, younger generations might be to, to connect through um, a laptop or a computer. It, all of their programs are also offered via phone. So really all they would need to have is a, a phone line in order to be able to connect with those programs. And again, they offer just a lot of different um, activities. And I would also recommend reaching out to your local senior centers in your area. Different senior centers are implementing um, programming differently during this time, depending on you know their capabilities. Uh, one of our locations did a parking lot bank go activity, which is, sounds kind of similar to Laura's drive up ice cream social, which sounded pretty cool. But um, yeah, it's just up to they all kind of drove up in their cars, they rolled their windows down, they used a megaphone to call the numbers. And I think participants flashed their lights to let them know when they had a bingo. So a lot of it is just, you know, thinking outside the box of how we can provide our regular programs to people in a more safe um, manner. Thank you so much, Holly. I again apologize for tightening <laughs> it up at the end. It's okay. <laughs> so much great information. I know you all sent uh, information to Janet. So we will make sure that all of the, uh, these great points that you shared with us are included in the press release that comes out afterwards. And there will be links and phone numbers that you provided. So um, that will be there for all of the seniors in our community, as well as any family members who might be wanting to connect them. Um, we do have a few media partners on the call. I'll just give it a second. I don't see any questions typed in at this point. Um, but I'll give it about, you know, 10 seconds, see if we get any additional. One question here for Jen. What solution do you see for older people without access to Wi-Fi? Um, it, you know, in general, we are aware of libraries that are offering free Wi-Fi. Um, and like sometimes it's in a parking lot or the, or the um, library itself. Um, the Wi-Fi is tricky. I mean, it really is. When I was doing um, programming years ago at the Area Agency on Aging, adult, older adults are already at a fixed income um, and lower incomes because they're not working. And so is it food or Wi-Fi? They're going to have food. 
Um, so the solution is tricky. Um, we need more affordable Wi-Fi is really the, 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 the key piece to this. Um, but again, that's what's so important. If we as um, you know, younger um, age groups know of anything, like I said, the library, sharing that with older adults um, so that they know, you know Wi-Fi. I mean, I think at some point of the pandemic, I don't know if it's still going on, but like Verizon and US Cellular, they were offering unlimited you know, data. Um, and older adults, letting them know that, that, hey, you could FaceTime and it wouldn't go against your data, you know, things like that, letting them know. Um, but the Wi-Fi is tricky. It, it's, it's a hard, there really is no key solution to it. Janet, if I could just, um, uh, or Brooke, I'm not sure who, who posed that question, but if sure. I could just kind of piggyback on that. Um, in Illinois, um, they do have a program called Illinois Care Connections, which um, allows, uh, area agency agencies, their providers to make referrals of their clients to receive a free tablet device and up to a year of free Wi-Fi. Um, it's something that came through the CARES Act that, you know, from the COVID-19 um, measures and a way to kind of get some technology into the hands of older adults. So um, in Illinois, that is uh, a possibility for people who may be experiencing some issues with being able to afford Wi-Fi or have reliable Wi-Fi. That is a program that can help with that. Great. Well, thank you all three so much for joining us. We greatly appreciate, again, all of this information. The recording of this will be posted on our website as well as on our Facebook pages, so you can feel free to catch any additional information there. Uh, we do plan on hosting another call on Thursday on the topic of COVID-19 and the flu, uh, so we encourage our media partners to join us for that. Uh, but in the meantime, thank you everyone for joining us and have a good afternoon. Thank you so much.